I want to start out by saying these are my views. I'm going to be talking about a lot of the work I do for English Heritage, but they are very much my views. And uh, there's particularly one slide that I have to be careful about because I put it in and I realized that it really should just be flagged to me. If it's flagged to EH, I might give them a little bit of grief. Um, but that's my own fault, so I'll let you know. <laughs> um, the, um, so essentially, where we, what, I, what I look after is um, the EH Archaeology Twitter feed. It's one of the things I really want to talk about, and at least to begin with. And, um, and then I'm going to go into kind of the background as far as where it all kind of came from over the last, say, well, since I joined the organization in 2007, and bringing you up to speed as to how things developed quite slowly. And initially, I found that quite challenging. But I'm now kind of appreciating the pace of change, because it's, while at first it was far too slow, it's now, I'm, I'm glad it's the pace is at least moving, and it's, it's a pace I'm quite comfortable with. So um, with the EH Archaeology Twitter feed, um, it's worth identifying who actually sits behind it. It is primarily me. However, it, it, I, I use it to represent these people as and when they can be bothered to produce content. And I will, I will, I will discuss that point a little bit further, because I think it is worth um, highlighting. The other, the other thing I wanted to bring up, I'm not going to discuss this a great deal, but it is something that I think is worth discussing, which is barriers around sharing data. I don't, you know, it's not something I, I really actively engage with. Other parts of the organization are far more engaged with that. Um, but it is something that I think needs to come into this realm because it, it can be a purely digital activity for, for people interested in engaging with archaeology. Um, and uh, the, the, I say these are the people that I represent, but actually the, the invitation is open to anybody at any age that considers themselves an archaeologist and that falls into that realm. And uh, I'll explore that a bit further as well, hopefully. And um, so, so to give you a bit of background about where things were, they weren't this at all. They were the EH website, and everything was on it. And um, that was sort of 2007, 2008. Um, we produced. If we produced anything, we produced it as PDF reports. So when we went out to Silbury Hill, suddenly we realized we better start talking to people because um, it was a big monument that a lot of people felt very invested in. And we needed to figure out ways to um, communicate with them. So the, the quick and easy route to doing that was to post rather dry um, PDF stories on the um, web. There weren't necessarily anything wrong with them. It was just they weren't particularly active or particularly dynamic. I suppose they had nice, nice easy preservation routes because they're already PDFs. Um, but um, after, after many years, really, it probably took until about 2010, we slowly developed um, within the team, kind of ad hocly under the radar, um, our own sort of social media presence. And, um, and eventually, the rest of the organization caught up and started employing people within corporate communications to do things like um, run social media teams and look after the, um, the social media presence of the organization and uh, do things like develop uh, policies and uh, social media properties criteria. So if you have an EH property and you, have to, and you want to have a, 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 a you know, Facebook page, you have to be open all year. You have to have two people ready to run it. So it's about resourcing these things and making sure that there's actually someone there to do something with it. Um, interestingly, some of when 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 I first started looking on <coughs> Facebook for um, for different um, presence of, of English heritage, there was the Whitby Duck, which I don't know if you could find anymore, but it was um, constantly on Facebook or Twitter, I believe, and uh, making a bit of noise. It's a rather odd character. Um, and uh, you can also go to the, uh, again, this one should still be there, but there's Jigsaw the Donkey at uh, Osborne House. So there, there certainly were some really interesting ones in the early days. I've not looked back to see if those are still there, but they were, they were good fun. Um, and they were, they were a bit more ad hoc, a bit more just staff saying, well, we'd like to have some social media presence, and you know, we're just going to go at it. Whereas now it's like, right, you need to fill in a form. You need to let us know what you're doing. And I speak of it as a negative thing, but it really isn't. It is quite helpful to know that people are actually being, you know, kind of, that we have these policies in place that, that, that we're going about it in a more formal way because it, it ensures that there's at least some acknowledgement of the resource required, even if it isn't actual realization. Um, and uh, so now we are sort of, we're, we're, I, I look at, I, I post pictures on the Flickr when we get to go out and do excavations. 
Um, and I link through from the Twitter account. I don't look after a Facebook page because it was identified as too resource heavy. So that was kind of that compromise. Um, and um, we do, and we have done in the past, some blogs from our sites. And it's been interesting <coughs> to see how, um, with, with what limited blogging we've done, how much traffic actually we do get from, from Twitter. It's still rather incredibly low, but when, you know, when we look at our click-throughs from, um, from Twitter onto those links that are coming from our blog, they actually tend to be reasonably receptive. And that is compared to pretty much nothing. But again, uh, I want to I want to kind of explore that a little bit more because the um, um, yeah I mean it's just about kind of getting to grips with with what we're doing. So um, first I'm going to explore the impact. I've already done the background, and then we'll go on to resistance and hopefully cover some ways forward. Um, and. Uh, so I was, I, this is the point where I start to talk about the number of followers I have, which we'll explain in the next slide. But um, on Twitter, I have 4,200 followers, which has taken me since about 2010. So again, I'm in that point now where actually it's, it's been enough of an investment that I see a regular incremental increase with me doing absolutely nothing. It's really quite amazing um, because I, you know, I might tweet once or twice a week, but I think that's actually a reflection of the fact that people like dormant users. And I'm not dormant necessarily, but being really loud as an organization isn't always to your advantage because um, it just gets a bit irritating to see your Twitter feed filled up with content you don't want or that is just, you know, all the same. And it, 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 so, so by being a little bit quieter, I, I, I personally think that helps a bit. But um, yeah, so I, I, I quite like the guy Kawasaki quote about um, the two types of Twitter users. And uh, so uh, this is the slide that can be associated to me. Please don't associate it to EH Archaeology. Um, and it, it's, it's a really good way to express the problem that I have, which is I, I'm, I'm high up there on retweet abuse. The reason I'm high up on retweet abuse is because I don't get a lot of content. I look at what other people put out there, and I broadcast it, because that's what I want to have. I want to have content for people. and. Sometimes being just being a channel for, for putting out other people's content and making it louder, being a bit of a bullhorn at least, means that, that, that I'm still engaging without having to constantly chase up colleagues to give me more and more information because it just that's not what that's not how they want to do things. And um, and so you know that's that's a real that certainly is a barrier that I have and uh, I'm, I'm a bit confused about the English misuse, but I'll have to get over that one. Um, I'm sure I'm sure I'm guilty of it. No, no, no two ways about it. Um, but what's interesting is is actually the numbers. I mean, I, I had some. I could show you some statistics from Hootsuite, the application we use, but um, I don't think they would be any way quantifiable. I mean, 4,200 users, and I'll get click-throughs that are, if I'm lucky, double digits, and. So maybe 40 would be, that would be exciting to me compared to what my normal activity of click-throughs are, which is, you know, as, as already has been said, is a, is a more substantial measure than actual number of followers. So, you know, even with a, a reasonably large number of followers, and particularly maybe not compared to the African burial sites, but certainly for the UK and a lot of other archaeology um, tweeters, this is a, that's actually a strong number. So I can only imagine, you know, I think there's other people, smaller numbers, who get far more web traffic and have far more um, clout, which is what this is actually making fun of. Um, so, but that's, you know, that's that's just what it is. I I, that, I don't really find that discouraging. It's not a barrier to me. Um, you know, it's in a way I'm kind of bumbling around in the dark, just trying to figure out what's going to work and hopefully, you know, if I keep doing that, it will, something will kind of come of that and fortunately I have the freedom to do that. And I think that um, I do get a level of engagement. I can discourse with people about different things, you know, like we'll get, we'll get artifacts emailed to, you know, sent to us from, on Twitter or someone will complain about how we incorrectly plastered the interior of a church and then I can go chase up how exactly that came about and give them some sensible response. It doesn't actually show all the inner workings of English heritage, which is something, uh, from what I understand, we've been accused of in the past. I'm not that long in the tooth in the organization compared to some. So um, 
it's, it's, it is what it is. Um, this was the um, later Silver excavation blog, which is now, um, we've, we've brought it down because it really, there's no point in leaving it up there. We can produce it as a PDF and put it on our site. It's far more sustainable and accessible to people. But ultimately, we wanted to just capture the content that was there and um, leaving it as a dormant site that we weren't maintaining wasn't something that um, corporately they were too happy about. So we, we brought this into a, a private space and we, we, we look after, it's, it should be available on the website. I'm really going to have to check that now that I put it up there. But um, the, um, the reason I wanted to show this is because um, they were, um, when, they were on the, when they were on site, the um, project manager was maintaining the block. She did an excellent job of it. Occasionally we were able to get some of our site archaeologists to do it as well. But um, when it came to giving, doing the site tour, they um, didn't put it on the website because they didn't want to have a whole bunch of people traipsing across the south of England to come to Silbury and, and get a tour. They put a notice on the parish, parish notice board and they still managed to have I think somewhere around 70 people come and their dog. Um, so it was, you know, they, there's this kind of, there, there's this reluctance as well as a kind of compromise between using new stuff and, you know, traditional techniques to, to meet specific needs. So it, it isn't always about digital when you want to get to particularly local audiences. And um, the big barriers that I've encountered are, um, amongst many of the ones that have already been mentioned, are, um, I think the first one's worth, worth talking about is ego. I mean, when I go to my colleagues and, you know, discuss with them different opportunities for doing different sorts of social media, it, it frequently falls flat, or I just don't get a response at all. One instance, we ha I was having to retweet stuff that was on the Guardian website for an, for an excavation. And, I mean, and they had access to the Twitter account as well. So it's this, you know, they're happy to talk to the traditional media because, well, they get kudos. But what's the kudos, what's in it for them, you know? And, and, and um, increasingly, I think that with a lot of archaeologists that, like, it certainly was brought to my attention by another colleague that, that a lot of archaeologists put, you know, their, their ego sits in the book. And when the book comes out, that is, that is what they've invested all their time for. And that comes in two forms of sacrifice. Anything that isn't the book, but particularly the da digital data, in many cases, are, are treated as secondary to getting that book out there with their name on it so they can see it on their friend's shelf when they go over for dinner or for drinks. Um, so, so we've got, and we've also got status quo, it's that kind of inertia, it's like I go, I do public lectures in town halls, that's my outreach, and you know, anything else that's beyond that isn't, it doesn't, doesn't strike them as, as particularly relevant, or it's just not, they're not ready to move on to it. Um, I was speaking to Steve Ellis, and I'm going to get the numbers wrong here, but they're, they're big enough, it kind of doesn't matter. He, he was working in Pompeii with iPads, and as a result, Apple made a um, lovely web video for him, and um, he, he said to me, more people saw his video than see the Super Bowl, and that's people using archaeology, doing archaeology in the field. Yes, they're using iPads, but that's an incredibly high impact, and it was somewhere around 60 to 80 million people. I mean, that's incredible, and that level of impact <laughs> from one video, you know, it just sort of makes a, you know, a town hall talk sometimes look a little bit like, what? But <laughs> the... Uh, the other thing is, of course, I mean, like, you know, does liking a video on YouTube really equate to, to someone taking their evening and going to go sit in the village hall? It's, you know, I just don't know about these kind of levels of impact and how they, how they measure up. Um, as an organization, fear is a, is, is a powerful tool. Um, and I hear about, you know, it seems like every time I deal with corporate communications, bless them, um, they, they like to, to make me aware of how scary the Daily Mail are and um, <laughs> how, it, how vital it is that um, we go nowhere near it, um, at least with negative stories. And that, that you know, um, you know, that could go badly wrong for me today. Um, but, the, 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 you know, it, it's, it's particularly in times like this that, that I think we're even more aware of how, how difficult and how trying it is to um, to be an outward-facing organization that still has ties to the government and still reliant on, on, on taxpayer money to, to, to fund what we do. And, um, you know, we, we, we do have to play it right because it's, it's scary times for everyone and uh, getting that wrong could really cost jobs. 
And um, I think um, the, the other thing is about, the, the, the thing about archae we are archaeologists, I mean, the reason I put that up there is because I was having a conversation with someone, and they were sort of saying, well, you know, we're talking about doing some public pages, actually, because right now all the archaeology content about what we do at least sits in the professional side of the English Heritage website. If you've had a pleasure visually visiting it, you'll have understood the revamp a few years ago divided a lot of the content along those lines. And um, as a result, there is no presence for archaeology on the public pages. The, the actual, you know, everyday visitors come see. They come see information about properties, about events, about the, the shop, and all of these other things. And archaeology currently isn't really that present there. Um, and so we were discussing how we wanted to go about doing that. And one of the suggestions was, well, could you get a journalist in to do it? And we are just like, yeah, but we do loads of outreach here. We have experience doing this. And that, you know, we were able to overcome that, that, that resistance and that, that barrier. But it is that kind of assumption that, um, and it's perhaps a training issue, that, that really we do need to get more and continuous training and how to create content, and particularly for the web. I mean, I've been twisting arms for the past three months to get as many of the colleagues that I have down in Portsmouth particularly doing a writing for the web course that's being offered internally because they know how to write articles, they know how to write publications, they know how to fill in context sheets, but they, they assume they know how to write for the web and it's about making it clear to them that they really don't and that it's, it's a skill, it's a craft that you have to learn just like every other style or genre of writing. And, um, and then, uh, and, and then, of course, resource. I mean, Doug gave a, a, a very clear <laughs> explanation of why that's an issue. I mean, I would, I would really suggest that going forward, you know, if you're going to have a blog, it's probably worth looking at at least a half a day of someone's time per week just to create one blog post. And that's because the first blog, first two blog posts, if it's an inexperienced blogger, will take a lot longer. And then, as the project carries on, it will get quicker. But um, also, it's about, it's about getting the resources and the training to do other types of social media and types of interaction. I mean, using video and, and podcasts to, to generate content, I think, is, 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 quite, is quite an important one um, and another way to engage with our audiences. And um, the, the other thing I, would, that, that I constantly hear is, is reading on screen is an issue. I print out everything. And, um, you know, I read it in front of me. Oh, 25% of what you read on screen, you don't, you're only taking 25% of reading on screen. I, I've always heard that number. I went looking for it very briefly this morning. I didn't find it. It was, there, there is some interesting research that's been done, I have no doubt, and I'm sure someone in this room has a greater knowledge of it than I do, but what I, why I put this up is because I wanted to just point out that actually, you know, the way we're reading on screen is changing, whether it's, e, you know, e-readers or tablets. We, we aren't reading the same way on screen as we were when it was this, you know. It's no longer just the screen that's sitting vertically in front of you. It can be sitting as a book does on a podium or any, anywhere else you need it to be. And it, and it can take the shapes and, 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 you know, be more conducive to perhaps greater comprehension. So it's just to kind of point out that that's a barrier that I think might be changing. and, and um, and I think, you know, it's worth considering, in the process of doing this, I did come across an interesting article that was referring to reading off of mobile phones as, as trying to read through a pinhole. So that was a fair enough point. Um, so I, I just want to kind of highlight some, perhaps, some ways forward. I've, I've put in the more sharing just to kind of go back to that original point I made about getting more of our data out there for people to use and in formats that are able for them to use. Um, but I think we also need more training, and we need to find ways to maybe get that training um, shared amongst ourselves, a lot more skill sharing would be really useful and I'm particularly keen to find people that are um, ready, willing and eager to do more video and audio style stuff because I think that um, when you get to grips with it, the impact can be a lot higher for the, the resource to impact ratio could be quite good. And um, I think too that one of the things I'm kind of wondering about too is, is you know, I wasn't here, I wasn't in the UK for the early days of of time team, but I'm wondering where all the humor is as well, and in the, the content we're creating. I mean, the first video you come to when you go on YouTube and look for archaeology is, is this, is this sort of double entendre sort of CD video of this guy and this girl locking eyes, and then he finds this really bizarre, um, 
Neolithic woman stashed into the side of what is clearly a North American trench. But um, it was, um, it's, it's just quite a strange little video. But my point is, is that people want to see video that's funny, and they want to see content that's funny. And archaeology can be funny, and it is about entertaining people at the end of the day, to, to get them to come and appreciate more what we do. Because I know for myself that my, my you know, that I'm reliant on tax dollars to pay my pay my bills. And if I don't have people interested and engaged in archaeology, whether it's for educational and, and more noble purposes, or if it's just to have something funny to laugh at on YouTube, it's it's about making them aware that we're there and, and getting them engaged with what we do. And you know, one can lead to the other. Um, and I think that um, we also need, we of course, we need more resources, but perhaps more resources. A better way of putting it is that we need to identify the level of resources required. And as a result, we can get the kind of content that we would expect to have, so that it's not just sort of ad hoc, thrown together, an adjunct to what we do. And, um, and I think, too, that, that takes me to my getting the right tools, really, because I think that we do need to consider, um, I, know, I mean, I, I, I sat, fortunately, at Computers and Archaeology in Southampton, the paper before me was, um, was, was on this project called Patina, which is looking at digital research spaces. But I use this as an example of um, the kind of social research spaces that we may need to consider having. This is Goodread. And on Goodread, you know, it's a social network for, book, uh, for people who write books, people who read books. They have everyone, uh, they, the general rule of thumb is on this website you will find better reviews than on Amazon. Okay, it's about people investing in the right social media that suits them and their needs and what they want. And I'm wondering if, you know, that's what we need to consider as well. And I mean, the same goes for um, Ravelry. I've had a colleague very kindly log into these sites for me. Um, <laughs> we're using her account, so I'm embarrassing her, I'm sure. But um, the point being um, that, you know, that these are people who are investing in different social networks, spending more time on them than they do on Facebook. And I'm just wondering if we need to look at this a bit more seriously. And I know it's a very difficult area because Obviously, we're a very niche audience, and it's, it's not clear to me how we would go about doing this, but it's just to kind of, I suppose, generate the conversation that, I, you know, I've, I've, I mean, I think for a single room like this, Twitter's a great tool. When you've got eight rooms like this, it starts to fall over dramatically and stops being as useful of a tool for following what's going on in a conference or in, you know, in, 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 different, in different, re different learning environments, I suppose. And so I just I just kind of think that there are areas where we need to we need to acknowledge that that while it is our nature to go out and find the tools that are there, I feel as archaeologists that's what we do. We use Mason's trials, but we, we, you know now maybe we need to stop adapting so readily and start to consider if there's different ways that we <coughs> should be developing tools that that, that maybe you know, fit, fit more than just archaeology, but that are more reflective of what we do as archaeologists, how we operate as researchers, as practitioners, but that also integrate how we um, disseminate information to the public and engage with broader audiences, so that it's, it's, a, it's more of an integrated environment instead of being someplace that is just for researchers, or just for practitioners. Uh, it's, you know, it's, that's kind of the, 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 the way forward that I've only managed to come up with. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's where I'll leave it. <laughs>